This is my second trip to your fabulous school. I was so impressed when we visited last year with the, we call him the exiled king of Tibet, Trichin, who sends his regards. Uh, I think starting with the words of Faiza and her family are very appropriate to what I'd like to talk about, which is at its heart, authentic voice. Um, to me, and I'll talk a little bit about my career trajectory personally and how that really influenced the beginning of By Kids, and why? Um, I think that right out of college, my feeling I'd been plucked in fourth grade by a teacher who thought I wrote well. She was right or wrong, we'll never know. Um, she really encouraged me to write and storytelling became a fantastic expression of what was in my soul. Um, and so my fourth grade stories which are embarrassing to look back on really were the beginning of what I think was the germ of real storytelling. So I was able, because I had the privilege of going all the way through this fabulous high school and then on to a fabulous liberal arts college, that's a luxury, right? And I then, I think when I decided that writing and journalism was where my passion lay. I was very fortunate to get a job at the New York Times. Now, those of you just about ready to enter the workforce, and maybe those of you in the workforce can sympathize with the fact that you go to a place like the New York Times, and they have a long line of people who are dying to work there, and they put me to work sorting the mail. Um, and I sorted the mail for a really long time, and I would go home well, I was at that point, yeah, I was getting paid $17,000 living in New York. I couldn't afford an apartment, so I was actually still living at home. And I would literally go home in tears to my parents and say, I'm so privileged to be around all these people, but I'm sorting the mail. I didn't work since fourth grade to be a writer to sort the mail. And my dad, I think, gave me the best advice ever, which was keep smiling, but most importantly, keep asking questions. And that was really what caused me to just make friends and learn. If you go through life saying, tell me about what you do and why you do it and how far from what you're really passionate about is it, you begin to really be able to write your own script a little bit better. Um, so lots of years at the New York Times, amazing people. And I will share with you, this is public, right? This is gonna go online. All right, so I'll tell this, you guys can, I'll tell it privately when I'm off mic. The bottom line is the New York Times is a bastion of white male privilege, right? And I began to see that that, if I was striving for authentic personal voice, having a white guy fly very briefly to a country that it, he or she knew nothing about, and putting it on the front page of the New York Times as if that was our only source of information began to strike me in a pluralistic democratic culture as, let's not say dangerous, but flawed, maybe even dangerous. Um, so I, I think in that process of seeing how on some level superficial the news media was in my personal experience um, and how limited the scope of international foreign news coverage for the American public. You know, the New York Times in the course of the years that I was there was needing to figure out revenue stream, right? And the easiest way to save money is to close the office in this country and then that country. And so what was happening is if you're relying on a place like that, which a lot of people rely on, and they're not actually out in the world feeding the pipeline, we're, we're all disadvantaged. So that became a very important piece to my professional life. Um, I then fast forward, thank you John for the wonderful introduction, realized that if you're spending all your time and money to spend your free time at film festivals and watching film, maybe that means you should make your money and make your career the filmmaking. <laughs> so, you know, got smart after a long while that filmmaking to me was a much more vibrant way of delivering story. Uh, I didn't quite understand how important it was going to be 
come to me that it became very personal. So any kind of documentary film. I remember seeing Roger and Me was Michael Moore's first film and just it literally blew me away that it could be all you got. Everybody in this room may be too young to remember the old um, public service things that they used to show us in school. They were black and white, no joke, from the 1940s. Jiminy Cricket teaching you not to smoke. And that kind of was my idea what documentary film was. We then had Ken Burns who began to change the way it was delivered, that it became more about you know, when he made the Civil War, it really was about going into the archives and finding letters, uh, personal letters of confessions of love and, and hopes for the future. That was something remarkably different, at least from what I'd been exposed to. And it really set off the, the lights for me that documentary film was a way to deliver a message in a really potent and impactful way. Now fast forward two little pieces that don't get written about on our website much. I had, my husband and I had two youngish children at the time, so my kids started eight years ago. And literally one night, I, we went to dinner with a whole bunch of Pulitzer Prize winning journalists, and I got home to my youngish kids, and I'm like, hey, how was your day? And we sat on the floor, and they recounted a day, and I, I wish that I remembered what that day, something had happened in the news that was profound enough so we were spending some time with it. And there they were, these, you know, they weren't even teenagers. They were telling me about how they viewed this event in such a pure, in such a non-egotistical, it was apolitical, it was just, they, they were authentic journalists. And it struck me, and I said to my husband, should have had it on tape, you know, we just came from this dinner where everybody's gotten awards for their journalism, and they're all about, it was all about self. It was about them pumping up and feeling good about the awards they had. And here, not that my kids are brilliant, they're like any kid, but here were my kids sitting, being much more authentic. And I thought, God, the world could use a little dose of this authentic journalism. Like, this is the real deal. Um, and then the really piece that never ever goes out, but I'll share it with you, is that my husband, who's thankfully fine, was diagnosed with Hodgkin's and was going through, at this very moment, chemo. Um, and I think f a profound personal experience is, for whatever reason, I was raised in a slightly, boys grow up to be important and girls grow up to get married, kind of, that was a little bit of my dad's philosophy. So I've spent a large part of my life overthrowing that belief. Um, here was my husband who was potentially not gonna survive. And I, for the first time in my life said, rather than working for Arthur Salzberger at the New York Times or working for George Soros at the after school, I feel like we're at a very critical time in the world that felt very dangerous to me. It was just when uh, Dick Cheney was on TV talking about going to war with Iraq, and I'm like, wait, I, I learned a little bit about Mid Middle East politics way back when. The story that he's telling is slightly different than, and do, do you know, do, does that make sense to you? And everybody's like, oh, they know what they're doing. And I was like, no, I actually really believe, having had ancestors come here on the Mayflower, that we really do have to be engaged citizens, and it's on our shoulders to participate and the light bulb went off that you're not able to participate fully if you're not getting what you need. So all of that went into the blender. We turned it on fast. I got brave enough to start something on my own, which was the personal piece that I was alluding to. And By Kids was started for these following reasons. One is I wanted to fill the gap of international news that was, I didn't see coming to American people. I have huge amounts of respect for young people and was seeing that I think we underestimate how hungry young people are for really sincere, full stories that we've dumbed it all down, but particularly for young people. And it occurred to me that in the life of at least my mainstream media career, I had never seen the voice of a child being used to speak for the many. And it struck 
you know, whatever social activism, I think, I, I think my mom took me out to protest against the Vietnam War in front of Lil Weicker's office. I was maybe five. Um, that, that piece stuck, that we really do have a responsibility as, as members of a democratic society to do our part. And this was what we decided was important. So off we went, we made five films. FISA, our wonderful filmmaker that you saw a little bit of, was the fifth film. So we've done a film in Mozambique done by a young boy who lost both parents to AIDS and talks incredibly movingly about what it means to have a family that's not traditional. So both parents are dead. His brother, because his parents were divorced before they died, lives in another village. And in the course of a 27 minute film, Alcides finds his brother, goes to collect him and brings him back to live with the woman that in the course of the film you learn Alcides has lived with for three months. And this woman has, you know, she sells lemons and candy in front of her little hut, makes 20 cents a day. And she has taken Alcides in and Alcides now at the age of 17 goes to bring his brother back and have this amazing family. So um, through the tears of a very emotional film about the ravages of AIDS, we, I think, pretty successfully were able to spotlight the resilience of the human spirit and the nobility and the, the joy that young people can find in a sometimes pretty depressing world. Uh, it luckily was not beginner's luck. We then moved on to a second film that was done by Trechin, who visited last year. So, you know, people often ask how we find our films. I, we do have a process. So we have a story search committee of journalists and nonprofit leaders and ambassadors all over the world that email us all the time with story ideas. Trechin found us a different way. And I don't know what, you know, I call it karma. We'd done the Mozambique film. I had a friend who's in marketing. She said, you need to meet this guy who knows the people at the Red Campaign. So the Red, you know, that thing where they sell red things to raise money for AIDS, and AIDS in Africa specifically. Um, and I talked to this man who is all about corporate marketing. And I said, so you work for this film festival doing corporate fundraising all the time? He said, oh no, I've been working on a film on Tibetan young people for the last seven years. I'm like, well, you now know what Buy Kids does. We're looking for young people. I'm personally fascinated with Tibet. Is there anybody in that circle that you've run across in your seven years that might be willing to make a film? He tells me the following story. Yeah, there's this kid who at 12 lost his father. He was the only male, um, what do you call that? Ancestor of the great kings of Tibet and the Dalai Lama coronated him. And if Tibet were still an autonomous country, and if the government were a monarchy, this kid would be the king. I'm like, oh, that is silly. I've never heard that story. Google, yep, there, there's the story. It's true. Um, so I say to him, if you were willing to reach out to this kid, do you think he'd make a film? And obviously, he, he and his mother, most importantly, said he would be happy to do it. Um, he tells an amazing story about what it means to have incredible responsibility, right? So he's, on the one hand, preparing himself to be the figurehead of a country. And on the other hand, the real story is that he may actually, having grown up in exile in India, may very likely never go back to Tibet, and Tibet may never be an autonomous country again. Um, so that brings up, you know, the 27-minute films can be the beginning, the spark of some really intense conversations about not just a person's life, as we try to do, but geopolitics. Third film was done by a young girl in India. I again heard that there are 80 million tribal people in India. So I learned in my now, I realize not so great education that there are the Brahmins and the untouchables. That's what you learn about India in my world. I'm now learning that there are 80 million people beneath the level of untouchables. I go, that can't be. Sure enough, 80 million of them. That's a lot of people. And we had one girl who has fought not just her own immediate culture, but the entire Indian culture to be educated. Um, 
And each of these, as I, I hope is clear, each of these kids is given a mentor. They work together for a month very intensely so that the mentor really channels their creative genius and guides the kid not only to figure out what their story is that they want the world to know and how to frame it, you know, for those of you in, story, in real active storytelling, stories need a beginning, middle, and an end, and you need to know how to harness it. Particularly in the case of film, you need to be able to match visuals with that story arc. Uh, they work together doing that. The kid shoots, writes a script, and then narrates the film. So what, what you've seen is all Fizes. She's the director, the cinematographer, and the narrator. Uh, and then oversees the editing, which is very exciting because they say, yeah, I, I don't like the way I look. And you're like, no, that's crucial or not. <laughs> um, and our, let's see, our fourth film was done by a girl who was displaced by the drug war in Colombia and Faiza's film. And I'll, I'll tell you anecdotally that, you know, I, I often say that the art of documentary filmmaking, you shoot and you shoot and you shoot and you shoot. And even with the best mentoring in the world, you don't always know what the full story is until you're in the edit room, uh, and the magic really happens there. And I admittedly am not very bright, so because the film for the first time was being done in my home city, I was able to participate unusually while it was being shot. Um, Faiza was mentored by the legendary Albert Mazels, who died very shortly after he mentored Faiza. It was an, I mean, think about an 86-year-old Jewish guy mentoring an 18-year-old Muslim woman. Like that alone was crazy. As it was unfolding, there was an experience where we, we, we weren't filming yet. We were just having Albert meet Faiza. And Faiza comes to Albert's office up in Harlem. And Albert, for any of you who know his work, is one of the most humanistic people and when referring back to this idea that if you're curious about people and are willing to put your hand out and say I'm Holly what's your name and what's your story could go I mean that alone could bring world peace and Albert was a master at saying hey what's your story and really listening so we have Faiza come and she comes with her you know, you can see she's got real style, right? The headdress was always really well thought out and her Converse sneakers, which I don't think you saw in the little bit here, her Converse always matched the headscarf and she's so groovy. She walks in with all the confidence in the world and sits down with Albert. And I'm a little bit nervous. Like her family has obviously agreed that this is gonna be okay experience for not just Faiza, but the family. And they sit down to talk. And here's a, a little snippet of what they talked about. Albert said, you know, the process of making a film is about finding common ground. So by the end of making this film together, you and I will find common ground. So Faiza, tell me a little bit about your story. And Faiza talks about coming to America and being bullied by these kids who thought she was Osama bin Laden's wife. And Albert sat back and said, you know, I thought it was gonna take a little bit longer to figure out where the two of us connected. But I grew up in Brookline, right outside of Boston. I was one of the few Jewish kids in town. And every day walking home from school, I got bullied, beaten up by the Irish kids. So look at that. We've already found where we're gonna go with this film. So as it was unraveling, I, we, you know, we set out to make a film about Islamophobia in post 9-11 New York. We've done that, but it ended up being also a film about what bullying is and how words um, I mean, she's a poet, did that part? She, she really turned first to a notebook and a pen that her English as a second language teacher gave her um, and found real solace and power in her ability to write her feelings on paper. Film was, to me, just one extension of that. And the film ultimately became, and that, this is why I say I'm not very bright, I didn't, we didn't go in setting out to do this, and you ended at the right moment, it became a film about immigration. And if there's ever a universal story for the American audience, I mean, we're all immigrants, right? Except for the Native Americans, we, our families all came from somewhere. And if you don't somehow feel the universality and the humanism of what Faiza's father is talking about to understand that, you know, it might not have been your parents, it may have been your great-grandparents or whoever, 
but people gave up an awful lot to come to this country. I just, there were moments making this film where like, wow, this is huge. So long-winded way of saying, I think that we've struck on something that we hope grows and prospers for many years. We had a tremendously successful run on PBS. I think it certainly surprised me how popular we were. We were very lucky that we fought hard. They came and said, okay, we love all five of the films. We're gonna make it a national series and we're gonna give you prime time. Great, what, what's the slot? They said, well, we're gonna put it on Thursdays at 10.30. I'm like, well, I didn't work in TV news, but that doesn't sound like prime time and I'm already asleep by then. And any student that we're trying to reach is likely asleep in the, the teachers there. I, I had a look on my face, right? The looks that could kill. I'm like, huh, so don't play poker with me, or do play poker with me. <laughs> they called a day later, they're like, we could tell by your response. I was like, eh? We've um, we fought hard and we've gotten Sunday night at 7.30 leading into Downton Abbey. I'm like, that's, now we're talking. <laughs> so we had to go head to head with Downton Abbey. We, we actually rocked the numbers enough so like they, they, PBS people measured us based on viewership, which, it went from a very solid number that competed with other long-standing series on Sunday nights. It went to six times as many viewers the next week, which means that everybody that watched told six of their friends, which is crazy cool, right? But the real metric they use is Facebook engagement. <coughs> and you can double check, you can corroborate my facts. Downton Abbey gets like 2,000 Facebook things every Sunday when they're on, we were getting 20 and 40,000 people. So the PBS people are like, wow, this is so important and, and it, it's working. You know, if we're really trying to move the dial on uh, empathy, which is what we're really all about, and we're trying to open American young minds to things in the world, our firm belief is the way into people's hearts and the way into actually changing people's behavior. You can't just talk at them, you have to actually speak to their heart. And what these kids do by telling their own story in a unguarded, very intimate way, I mean, you're in their house, you're, you're with their family, you, you're in Fiza's bedroom. You can't help but make friends with these kids. And as I, I like to quote uh, my friend who runs UN Peacekeeping, who says, I, don't, I would never say this myself, but Edmund says it, I'm happy to quote him. He says, you know, if you have enough people make friends with each other in the dark, that now every one of you and Pfizer are friends, you don't shoot each other when you know and care about each other. So keep telling these stories, keep exposing people to these stories, and we'll be a happier, friendlier, more empathetic place. So hope, hope that's true. Um, I think because what we're all about is conversation and having the film be the beginning of a conversation. I would love to answer questions, lob some <coughs> thoughts at you to see what your responses are and maybe John will help me pick people or it seems like a small wieldy group. Um, and feel free, you know, I've, I, I, I hope I've explained the premise of Buy Kids enough. I hope I haven't bored you with my progression professionally. Um, but, and fair game, you can ask me anything. Yes. What's next? Oh, good question. So the art of being the head of a small nonprofit is fundraising, right? So I spend 90% of my time raising money and I spend 10% of my time making fabulous films. We've gotten far enough along so people, we don't have to start from zero. Um, PBS is excited enough about it, so they're helping fundraise. So we are already well into the way of season two. And I will tell you that we've got, we're editing a film that was done by one of the former mentors who did the India film. When we have a 12 year old girl in Nicaragua whose family is part of the coffee growing community being devastated by climate change. And I have personally needed and wanted to tell the global, you know, climate change is really the biggest problem we have, right? It's very hard to figure out, or it was until we stumbled on this, how to tell that story with a kid who may not understand the context. 
Um, and glaciers don't melt in a month that the mentor is spending wherever they are, right? So trying to figure out the visual piece, the fact that we all drink coffee, it's a huge market for the Americans. I think this film may very well be our most important film to date. And then we've got four other films in the works. We're gonna work on um, really starting a conversation about race by having a, film, a kid who's been incarcerated in New York City, He's gonna be mentored by Marshall Curry, the award-winning filmmaker. We've got a young boy in Bhutan who was studying to be a monk, and the fact that Bhutan was this Shangri-La closed culture without television until 1989, and the king decided that TV was cool, uh, and everything changed, so the fact that this boy is choosing the old-fashioned way <laughs> will be an interesting journey. Um, indigenous people in Guatemala. Uh, we're looking for a film in Brazil, if anybody has a good idea. We have a mentor who only wants to go to Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm forgetting a few, but fundraising so that we can make these films. And season two will be sometime in 2017 and on from there. Well, when your filmmakers start filming, do they, what's their concept of who's going to be the audience? Uh, you might think at first it might just be kids, but I'm sure a lot of adults are pulling as much and different messages maybe from the films. So, you know, we are very transparent about what our purpose is. I mean, we're trying to make Americans, particularly young Americans, smarter about the rest of the world. So when we talk to any potential filmmaker, we and their family, we say, you know, we're trying to use your particular voice to speak for your entire community, your entire culture, um, and we want as many people, not just in America, I mean, we're, we're teeny, we're a teeny little nonprofit. We have successfully checked the box of the American audience and are happily working on an international audience. Personally, it's most exciting to see that kid's film back in their own community because, you know, they're, they're, I'll talk a little bit, and this applies to anybody doing journalism, I had a few worries about this. Like, what does it mean for the kid? Like, we go into a community, there are 80 million tribal people in India. Why, why Jayshree? Why do we pluck her out of obscurity and give her this amazing experience and exposure to a world-class filmmaker and ideas for the future about college and access to resources that she never dreamed possible. That's a moral issue, right? And we've had to be very thoughtful about how we make sure that the community doesn't feel that, you know, we're not, we're not knighting a star, we're not, we're not doing a reality show, we're letting that kid speak for their community. So when we've shown the films and the community embraces that, I mean, I often say that um, our first film was done in Mozambique and I remember that it was, um, produced by the executive producer of Law & Order SVU. He was a big Hollywood guy, and he called me, literally landed back in Hollywood and called me from the tarmac. He said, you know, I, I understood how this would affect the kid's life. I had no idea how it would affect the community, um, and it affected my life in a very profound way. That's a whole other story. But the point of that little piece is that the community, in this case, Neil said, these are people who assume that when Americans show up, they show up with a gun to shoot, that it's all about force. And that we heard over and over again how amazing it is that you as Americans are coming not to take our story, not to shoot us, literally, but to, to allow us our own voice. And that, in, you know, we call it our format of guerrilla diplomacy. It's just really powerful. Um, so everybody in Alcides's town and his grandparents' town see Americans differently. So I, I think, you know, did we put that in our strategic plan as something we wanted to accomplish? No, but I think we're, we're able to do that. Um, and there's some other, you know, like what responsibility then do we have this kid? We've intervened in their life, right? So to your point, you know, as I'm fundraising, I very much want to um, have a big pot of money so that we can guarantee each of these kids, not just high school, but college if they want it. I mean, we've scrapped it together and each of these kids have made decisions that they never would have otherwise. I mean, they're all 
they're all going to college with some form of help. I mean, Trichin um, would have gone to, I don't know, he would have gone to school in Dharamsala in the Tibetan community to study Buddhism. And the Dalai Lama, after he made this film, as his guide said, you need to go to college in the US. And funny little story is, we just finished making this film. Like, I didn't have gray hair when I started doing this. It's hard. I get a call from his mom saying, so His Holiness says he needs to go to college in the US. And by the way, my two kids that I talked about hadn't yet gone through the process, so I had no idea how to be a college looker. I'm like, wait, what? Like, now really I'm his mother? Um, and by lots of good fortune, we found a boarding school for him that gave him a three-year full, full ride, and he's now in college in the US on full scholarship. Um, so we are able to pull it off, but it would be nice if we could actually guarantee it as a moral thing, um, but we're working on it. Yes? Do you plan on revisiting these people in maybe five or 10 years from now? Because I think it'd be pretty interesting to see. Uh, it, so, filmically? Yeah. Yeah, we um, kind of obviously, now, kind of. yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, I think uh, at the end of each of the, the when what you see uh, if you go on to the 13.org website, um, is the slightly recut version. And in each of the five films, they have a little bit of a coda as to where the kid is. I mean, in some cases, Alcides made his film six years ago. Alcides is now married and has a kid and has his own film company in Maputo. They didn't put that in, but you know, these kids are, it's, it's a big old family. And they, but it would be nice to revisit it filmically. That's a good idea. We try to do it a little bit on the website, but it would be nice to do it more robustly. Good idea, thank you. Yes? How do you decide like, who you're gonna do the story on? Um, good question. So I talked a little bit about the process, about the story search committee, but more process is that the board and I kind of like the millennium goals. You know, if you think really big topics like climate change, we have a list of 10 and we basically, do, we raise money and we do, the first one was the ravages of AIDS. The second one was cultural preservation. The third one was displacement. Uh, fourth one was access to education for girls. And the fifth one was Islamophobia. And now we're just working our way down thematically. Uh, once we, we made that list, and by season two, we'll have to make a new list, but give me some time on the next, the 15, no, yeah, 11 to 16. Um, we then decide on a country. You know, a whole lot of this is about having stories that haven't been covered. So an example, we were knowing that we wanted to do a film on displacement. And at that point, George Clooney was flying back and forth to Darfur, and we were beginning to really understand the dynamics at work in the Sudan. And it was clear that we didn't want to do that film because everybody was talking about it. Um, and in that case, one of my board members is Colombian. And at the board meeting that we were talking about how to do the displacement film, he said, do you know that Colombia has the second largest displaced population in the world? I don't know anything now, but right? I go back to, to Google, sure enough, he's right. Second largest displaced population. Um, and he, sa he followed on by saying, do you know why? And we're all like, no, why? He said, well, because Americans and Europeans do drugs and it's been fueling a drug war in Colombia for the last 40 years. And so for the first time, why don't we do a film where the cause of this girl's displacement is America, right? So a high school kid can watch that film and say, oh, by me doing this, she's doing that. That loops it back in a really interesting way. So off we went. Um, we then, once we've decided on the country where the story is not on the front page of the Times, we then find a nonprofit to partner with and we work hard with them to find a group of kids that we can choose from. We usually narrow it down on paper because any of you in the film business know that film is a very, like people can look fabulous on paper and you get into the room and they, maybe the mentor and the kid, they don't like each other's smell or they, whatever, reminds them of their terrible second grade teacher, who knows what. 
there's a lot of chemistry that goes into it. Um, so we usually narrow it down to about five kids and then let the mentor pick the filmmaker when they get there. Um, the first time we did it, Neil, this guy that I'm talking about, a major Hollywood guy who makes decisions all the time, he kept calling me like four or five times a day before he left. He's like, I, I'm just so afraid that I won't know how to pick the kid. I'm like, you, you, you tell Mariska Hargitay every day what to do. How can you be afraid of anything? And um, we, we Skyped, the, I guess it was the third day they were there. He's like, oh, I figured it out. Here's how you pick a director. You find the kid who can boss everybody around with a smile on their face. <laughs> I go, That's, that goes into our best practice. Um, so we then pick the kid and then we pair the mentor who, you know, A, has the time to be away for a month when the timing is right. And, you know, in the case of some of these mentors have the language capability and then off they go. So it starts thematically and it ends with chemistry. <laughs> Good question. Yes? <clears throat> this is on the search aspect. Um, I was wondering, does your team ever look at social media to recruit stories? Because like we as millennials, we're, you, we're basically recording our life most of the time. Do you guys ever look at that to like cultivate stories? I won't say no, but I don't, you know, we're not trolling social media to find stories. Um, we've we used social media to try, you know, once we've decided what the theme is, we've often used social media to find people. You know, like teachers are actually really good resources. Uh, I, you guys are probably way cooler than the teachers in, in my immediate circle of advisors. Teachers are not typically on social media where the kids are. Um, so that's not how we reach the teachers. We send them a good old fashioned email and say, in the case of FISA, it literally was a call out to any New York City teacher I knew. I said, we're looking for a Muslim girl who's willing to be in a room with an old Jewish guy to tell her story. And we got a lot of response and met a lot of kids and FISA was it. So. Uh, doesn't mean we won't do it, but we haven't, to this point, relied on it. I mean, it, that, yeah, we're, we're kind of coming at the story because it's thematic first. Uh, we, uh, yeah, not yet, not yet, that's the answer. Yes? Are these for sale on DVD? They are all available on Amazon. And do it quickly because somebody just told me we have um, each of them is available for $19.99 or $150 if you're using it institutionally. And one of my advisors like, take the $19.99 one off. If anybody wants the film, they'll pay $150. So buy it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and I've given John, you have, you've got the Tibet one. I'll make sure, I'll mail you five so you can put all five of them in the library here. That's right. And Lene's our, uh, Lene's our library. library. Oh, there you go. And they're also, um, we did a deal very early on with Discovery Education. So there's, if you subscribe to Discovery Education, they're all available with the school guides there for free. Yes. Um, Hi. Hey. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to touch a little bit on, um, I think for a very long time, we kind of thought about prejudice as, as you said, white male privilege. And uh, a part of the, the struggle was to get other stories heard. Uh, people who were marginalized or people whose opinions or point of views or stories may have been left out. And sometimes I think we touch on things in our classrooms where I hear today from a lot of young white males who don't feel privileged, who feel kind of somewhat displaced themselves. And I have three sons as well who um, I kind of have to explain to them what white male privilege is. Um, so I'm wondering how even the conversation about uh, prejudice is changing and how in, in terms of being more inclusive, you know, we're trying to include more voices and we're trying to, um, and you know, for a lot of young men who have felt sort of, you know, that that's not me, I'm not going to be, you know, FISA in the school ground, you know, I, I don't want to be the brunt of, um, you know, that vehicle of prejudice. And I'm just wondering if you do any focus groups with your, because um, I hear that a lot from young men in my classrooms. and. I'm just wondering if you do any focus groups or thoughts on that, on how just the whole dynamic of prejudice is changing. 
Uh, I, I, we don't do focus groups. I mean, the parallel in our world is when we do a screening with the filmmaker. And to uh, the focus group for me is really hearing the kind of conversation that ensues. Uh, I would say this is a two-part answer. I, my kids go to a private school in New York called Dalton. And Dalton, if you read the New York Times, is both admirably and frighteningly struggled with race for the last 10 years. They made the move very smartly and wisely and admirably to make sure that the incoming class, the kindergarten last year was 51% African American. What we've all learned is that that's step one. And if you don't actually incubate the whole ecosystem, you're gonna run, I mean, you're gonna run into problems changing any culture, but that became really, really clear to everybody. And it's taken, we've been there 15 years and have slowly seen. So we, as a family, have learned how to talk about any kind of discrimination. I mean, I, I, I had to, we, my family exposed us to difference by having fresh air kids. And we had a, a kid from Spanish Harlem and a kid from Harlem every summer. And I, you know, I, I think that really helped me just as a human being understand that Monty and Jean were just troublemaking teenagers just like my friends. And the fact that they came from different kinds of families was just something we could do around the dining room table. And I think it gave me a certain comfort in saying, look, I'm a white woman. I can't change that fact. How does it feel for you as whatever? What does that feel like to have just heard that on the news or, you know, like there was an incident, this one, yeah, I better not tell that story on camera, I'll tell you later. Um, like it's a learning process. And I, I think you know, back to your point about focus groups, the only thing we can do is to allow, you know, our school guides are meant to be really for teachers who don't understand how to access some of these conversations and giving them a little bit of help. That's the best we can do with our limited resources. I think we've been very careful to, to allow, you know, basically it's a, a plate of choices of ha here's how to start some really hard conversations, which is the whole point of this. Um, and you can't, the wonderful thing about it, having come out of journalism where we didn't have fact checkers the way they do at a place like the New Yorker, but if you write something for public media, it is it needs to be triangulated. And what's kind of subversively wonderful about our films is that you can't argue with these kids. It's their story. So it, it's fact fiction or anything in between. It is their story as they choose to tell it. Um, I'm not, you know, I, all I can say is I've watched the conversation about, it's not even white male privilege, it's that I didn't understand until last year we had a guy named Glenn Singleton brought in by Dalton and it was a weekend long training for parents. And sadly, the people that were there were not the people that we should have had there, right? Like the really racist parents who needed to be there were doing whatever they do. The people in the room were like, we're really trying, we're really trying to expose our kids to the right thing. But what I learned is, back to my point about being able to lean into discomfort, you know, we have a really horrible legacy of slavery in this country, and until blacks and whites are able to acknowledge that squarely and not be polarizing like a lot of these conversations become, and become conversations about the wrong thing just to say, you know, like, help me understand and how do we move forward together rather than I'm right, you're wrong. And what, but my point personally is that I learned how much privilege comes with being white. And I had sadly, even in a liberal background, never understood that. I didn't know that when I get up in the morning and when I go to bed, I, it comes with a whole checklist of things that they're, you know, people that I think are my equals, they're not getting the same. And that, it, you know, it's, it's upsetting. There, it comes with a lot of pain. Um, but until we all get comfortable with that and can talk about it openly, and, I, you know, I hope the film on race be, be part of that. And, you know, the focus group really is in the rough cut. You know, in filmmaking, it's about putting, like the, back to the Nicaragua film, there's 
there's a scene in it where the mom is in the garden with her daughter who's made this film talking about how this is really all of our problem. Like the fact that the Roya rust is killing the coffee because they have so much rain because of climate change. It's amazing that these all, almost, you know, like out of work, out of business people, poor, poor, uneducated, understand more about global warming than anybody I know. They, they live it. And the mom says in the garden, and you'll see the film in its final form, not sure yet if this scene will stay, she says the Red Cross has come and said, you have to plant two trees for every tree you cut down. And one of our advisors, speaking to the focus group, was like, well, that's just stupid. That's like, that's not, why blame this poor woman? It's not, global warming's not happening because she didn't plant one tree. Get that out of the film. And on the other hand, the storytelling of it is that that's actually what she believes. And if that can become part of a conversation, then, then we're, in, we're in a good place. And, and the race film is gonna be, will be really important. So stay, stay connected and we'll have you involved in that. Do we have to be conscious of time? I think maybe one more. Any brave one to be the last word? I just want to ask if you have 90% of your time devoted to fundraising and 10% devoted to what? Making, making the film, like being creative. Do you travel to any of these uh, locations? Uh, this was my, my, I married to a man who was like, I know you're a, a global, you know, you're a gypsy. But if you want to get married and have kids, you have to promise me you don't go away for more than two weeks at a clip. And I'm like, oh, so the, the by kids, literally when I'm being a little facetious, I say was, I built this so I could live vicariously. Um, I have not traveled to any of these places except Colombia. Um, we've stumbled on a great recipe for doing these films, which is to find a very wealthy person who dreams of being a filmmaker, they don't have to be good at it, who's invested in some way or another in the country or the story. And Colombia was how we learned to do it. Very rich friend of mine, is Colombian, said we will, you know, you'll get a house, a driver, blah, blah, blah. We'll, I'm like, oh, really? She said, why don't you, because Colombia is dangerous, before you send your best friend from growing up, who's a reality show producer and willing to produce this film, before you send Susan down there, why don't you come with me to see? So I brought one of my daughters down, but typically you know, our budget allows for the mentor to get a plane ticket, a very modest per diem, and no four seasons, and off they go for the month. So no need for me to go, really. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.